Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Last time we were talking about this movement of the leaders of what we call forensic psychiatry, courtroom psychiatry, to expand psychiatry's role in the courtroom. This was in the 1940s and 50s. And we talked about these Wells and Gorshin cases and the role of Dr. Bernard Diamond and attorney Charles Gary. I realized that I hadn't given you one more quote from Dr. Diamond. Once this diminished capacity defense had passed muster with the courts, so we had a foundation as successful with regard to what Diamond and Gary wanted to do. Uh, and, and then we'll move on to showing what the results were of this new area of psychiatry's involvement in the courts. So a few years later, Diamond, in writing in the Stanford Law Review, looking back on his work in establishing that precedent and uh, well ensconced in the legal uh, psych psychiatric communities, he said, I concede that this whole business of lack of mental capacity to premeditate, to have malice or entertain intent, is a kind of sophistry. We must utilize these legal technicalities to, the, to permit the psychiatrist to gain entrance into the trial court. The next step is to expand the principle of limited or diminished responsibility of the mentally ill offender to include all definitions of crime. So there's a very frank admission that basically it was the belief of Dr. Diamond and all his colleagues. He was not a renegade. He was a leader of the forensic psychiatrists. We want to be involved in more and more stuff in the courtroom. And society, you need to let us do that. So let's move on then and see what happened. I'm going to give you an example of a rather spectacular manifestation of what can happen when psychiatrists were given more and more influence in the criminal courts? Another case in which the diminished capacity defense, which remember is not an insanity defense, it has a different standard, but it does deal with the alleged mental state of the person at the time they commit the crime. That's the issue. What was your knowledge? What was your purpose? What was your capacities at the time you committed the crime? Uh, committed the crime. So it's not looking into the future. It's not testing your ability to do something now. It's looking back. That could be months or even years in the past to the time when you're going to go on trial. And psychiatrists are the ones who are going to be examining for that. So let me tell you a little background of the trial of Dan White in 1978. Dan White was a supervisor of the city of San Francisco. We have a board of supervisors, like many cities, that are elected district by district. Dan White had not been a politician in the past. He had been a fireman. And before that, he was a veteran, had fought in the military, had been a police officer. So in his background, he was obviously an athletic guy. He is familiar with weapons because of his b background both in the military and the police. And that's important to understand when you hear a little more about the case. Now, Dan White uh, was on the Board of Supervisors, a, a, more on the conservative bent somewhat. Somebody else on the board was Harvey Milk. Now, unless you're of an age to remember those days, uh, you wouldn't, that name wouldn't ring, but it, it does uh, now to many people because Harvey Milk was the first openly gay politician in the United States. Of course, there were other gay people who were politicians, but they were keeping it in the closet because of where society was at. But San Francisco, of course, was well known for being friendly to the gay community, and we had a very significant and politically active gay community in San Francisco, and Harvey Milk was their representative. And Dan White didn't necessarily agree on certain issues. Okay, Dan White eventually 
decided that he was not happy being on the Board of Supervisors. I don't know the details, but he resigned from the board, possibly for financial reasons and other reasons, and then began to get pressure from people we, you know, that they didn't like the fact that he resigned and he changed his mind. So he went to the mayor, George Moscone was the mayor of San Francisco. He was of a liberal persuasion, pretty receptive to some of the wishes of the gay community on certain issues and the liberal San Francisco community. Dan White asked George Moscone to reappoint him to the board. But Moscone decided he couldn't do that. So that had been announced. He was, Dan White was not going to get reappointed. The facts that eventually came out in the murder of Mayor George Moscone and Supervisor Harvey Milk are the following. The Dan White, the morning of the killings, loaded his 38 caliber revolver with hollow point bullets. These are bullets which have a greater explosive force when they enter the something. And went to City Hall. I'm giving you these facts because these are all going to be relevant to what's coming next, which is psychiatry's role in his trial. City Hall was cordoned off at that time because of some construction. So you had to go through a metal detector in the front door. He didn't want the gun that he was carrying. Well, I'm going to infer that he didn't want the gun to be noticed. I can't see how else, what other reason there could be. So he did not walk up the main steps of City Hall where he would be confronted with a guard at the metal detector. He walked around to a window that was being worked on by some of the construction workers and gave them some information about why he needed to go in that way. I don't know exactly what, but they allowed him to go through the window. Therefore, he was able to get in the building with his gun. He went to the mayor's office, said he'd like to talk to the mayor. And that happened. He was, went into the office, began to have a discussion with Moscone about this situation of his being reappointed or not, pulled out his gun and shot the mayor twice. The mayor was lying on the floor wounded. White walked over to him and shot him twice more in the head from inches away. He then reloaded his weapon, went out in the hall, and started to look for Harvey Milk, who had become his, more or less his opponent in some, this issue of whether or not he would get reappointed. There was no love loss between Milk as a representative of the gay community and White's constituency. He asked Milk if he could speak with him. They went into Milk's office. White took out his gun, shot him twice walked up to him and shot twice more in the head. So each man, by any common sense understanding of that evidence, which was of course presented at the trial by the prosecution, had been wounded first and then executed at close range with two more shots to the head. Moscone ran down the hall, um, excuse me, uh, uh, Dan White ran down the hall, went out a window, went to a local church, called his wife, and then together turned himself in to the police that, that same day. So obviously, to anybody with any reasonable understanding would understand that Dan White had committed murder. Now, the intentional murder is the intentional killing of somebody under the law. You can kill somebody in a way that is not murder, but it's still a serious crime. That's what we usually call manslaughter. And the law has a provision for making a judgment about what your purpose was when you killed somebody. So the idea that we need to look at somebody's state of mind is not the same as the issue as to whether we need psychiatry in determining what somebody's state of mind is. And when you come back next time, I'm going to then take us into the trial so that we can look at this issue of what happens when you not only look at, well, what was somebody's state of mind at the time they committed the crime, which would distinguish between murder and manslaughter, 
but we allow psychiatrists to engage in the circus which was begun by Dr. Diamond and Charles Gary, which you heard about in the last session in the Wells and the Gorshin cases. Thanks for coming, and I'll see you next time.